Welcome to the third webinar in our series, Fighting Back, Responses to Jew Hatred. I'm Andrea Spindle, Executive Director of the Canadian Antisemitism Education Foundation. Today, we will hear from a legal expert who has fought many battles on the college campus in defending Jewish students and Jewish civil rights. Elisa Lewin has dealt with a litany of experiences that might worry many Jewish parents whose young adults are already attending university or will be heading off this year to a university. Elisa will talk about responses and solutions to combat Jew hatred on campus so that no one feels they ever need to hide their Jewish identity and their Zionism. I would like to start by thanking two donors for sponsoring today's webinar. Special thanks to Meir Pearl and Craig Reimer, and thank you to our wonderful organizational co-sponsors, the Atlanta Israel Coalition, Americans for a Safe Israel, Americans for Peace and Tolerance, Canadians for Israel's Legal Rights, Canadians for Jewish Research, and Jew Hatred Canada, Harut Canada, the Lodger Synagogue, the Matatias Project, Advocates for Civil Liberties, the North Carolina Coalition for Israel, Doctors Against Racism and Antisemitism, Rhode Island Coalition for Israel, the Israel Committee of Sonoma County, the Lewin D. Lewis D. Brandeis Center for um, Human Rights Under Law, Hasbara Fellowships, Adith Israel Congregation, the Law Fair Project, and UK Lawyers for Israel. It is truly wonderful to have the cooperation of so many Zionist, activist-oriented organizations and synagogues that value CAF's work and value collaboration. If anyone watching today would like to also collaborate and add your organization's name to future webinars and help promote our work, then please feel free to send me a message. CAF is actively promoting the inclusion of education about anti-Semitism in Canadian professional associations and colleges such as the Ontario Teachers College and the Ontario Association of Social Work and Social Service Workers. I invite you to check out the professional bodies in your own province or state. Have they all adopted a professional advisory mandating training on anti-Black racism, anti-Asian hate, anti-Indigenous hate, anti-Islamophobia training, but ignored Jew hatred? We are seeing that here. CAF is actively monitoring and countering the claims of pro-Palestinian groups that are adopting IH, the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, which includes recognizing anti-Zionism as anti-Semitism, is silencing Palestinian voices. Help us challenge the lies and expose this Jew hatred and anti-human rights practices of the Palestinian Arab regimes. We are unapologetic Zionists. We confront anti-Semitism that masquerades as anti-Zionism. We are building pride and confidence among Jews. Please consider making a donation to CAF to assist in our work and to reach ever more people. I am now very pleased to introduce Elisa D. Lewin, president of the Lewis D. Brandeis Center for Human Rights Under Law, which advances the civil and human rights of the Jewish people and promotes justice for all. In this time of resurgence of anti-Semitism on college and university campuses, the center works to empower students by training them to understand their legal rights and educates administrators on best practices to combat racism and anti-Semitism on campus. Elisa is also co-founder and partner in Lewin and Lewin LLP, which specializes in litigation, mediation, and government relations. Two of her successful legal cases are landmark in their widespread implications. Listeners might not know that for decades, anyone born in Jerusalem had a passport that suggested they had no country, as the US and other countries would not allow the name of Israel to appear following the city's name. Ms. Lewin represented a client who after an 18 year battle was effectively the first US citizen to receive an updated US passport that listed his birthplace as Jerusalem, Israel. I believe that both Canada and the UK still won't do this on the false premise that the future of Jerusalem is yet undecided. Elisa and her father, Nathan Lewin, also successfully represented a family that won a landmark tort litigation, which established the right of American victims of terror to obtain damages under American law against organizations that knowingly provide financial support to international terrorist entities. 
Elisa began her law career in Israel, where she clerked for the Supreme Court for Deputy President Justice Menachem Allen. She is a past president of the American Association of Jewish Lawyers and Jurists and an award recipient of that organization for her distinguished pursuit of justice. I invite you to submit questions for Lisa through the Q&A function on your Zoom screen. The questions will be handled by Mariana Fox, a third year student at Ryerson University in Toronto and a former IDF soldier, a proud Zionist and an activist whose own experience on campus has made her very sensitive to the claims by anti-Zionists that they are not anti-Semitic. Mariana participates actively in CAF's End Jew Hatred Canada direct actions. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the CAF website and made available to all of you who have registered. And we invite you to then listen again and share it. And now over to Elisa. Thank you, Andrea, for that really very gracious introduction and to you and to CAEF for putting on this program and for inviting me to join you and participate today uh, to discuss this really important and troubling topic. Uh, I, I came on board as president of the Louis D. Brandeis Center, as you described. It's an organization, a nonprofit civil rights organization that engages in legal advocacy, research, and education in order to use the law, really, to combat anti-Semitism, particularly the anti-Semitism that we see uh, taking place on campuses, not only across the United States, but as you've described, I mean, this problem is, uh, is happening around the globe. And so in the United States, there are certain, um, there are certain approaches, legal approaches that we've taken that I think could serve as a model for other countries. And I'm happy to talk about that today and share some of what's worked for us, because maybe it might help others. So the first overarching question that we have to ask is, you know, if anti-Semitism is society's oldest hatred, why does it seem so difficult for society to recognize the Jew hatred that our students, our faculty, staff, employees are experiencing, particularly on these university campuses? And I think there are multiple reasons for that. The first overarching reason is that many people today really don't understand anti-Semitism. So they can't recognize it when it happens, right? Most people, if they understand anti-Semitism, what they are able to recognize is the anti-Semitism that resembles the Holocaust, right? Today, people, if they see a swastika, they acknowledge that's anti-Semitic. If they hear or are aware that there's um, Nazi white supremacist propaganda, that they'll say is anti-Semitic. If an individual appears to be targeted because they look Jewish from their dress or they're recognizable as Jewish because of their practice, right? Then people will say, okay, if that individual is targeted, for example, a shooter goes into a synagogue and opens fire while Jews are worshiping, that's anti-Semitic, right? We'll accept that as anti-Semitic. But much beyond that, many people don't recognize today's anti-Semitism. And so what they fail to understand is that while anti-Semitism is society's oldest hatred, it's difficult to recognize because it morphs. It looks a little different in every generation. There's one constant, however, and that one constant is that no matter what the generation, no matter what the era, what anti-Semitism does is it takes whatever that society, whatever that generation, that period views as its worst misfortune as the evil that has to be confronted and it scapegoats the Jew. The Jew becomes the cause of that misfortune. So whether we can go back to the Jews who are alleged to have been the Christ killers or the Jews were the ones who poisoned the wells or were responsible for disease and death um, in the bubonic plague, right? The Black Death, Jews were blamed for that. We saw similar allegations during COVID, Jews being blamed for COVID, whether it's that uh, economically Jews uh, were for the, for the communists, the Jews were the capitalists, or the other way around. For the capitalists, the Jews were the communists. For the, the Nazis, right, who were seeking a pure Aryan race, 
the Jews were the ultimate race polluters. And today, when our society today has embraced the idea of human rights and that the worst evil that our society must confront is racism, apartheid, settler colonialism, Jews are lumped together as white. Doesn't matter now what the background, where we come from, Jews are considered white, oppressors, colonialists. Again, Jews are the source or the worst offenders. And if you understand anti-Semitism, you realize that historically the way anti-Semitism has been used, it has always been used to other the Jew, to push the Jew out, to deny the Jew his place in society. This is the way Erwin Cutler, right, who is the former attorney general, he's now the current in, in Canada, your envoy on to combat anti-Semitism and on Holocaust uh, issues. So he, as he described it, right, traditional anti-Semitism sought to deny individual Jews their place in society. And then there's a new form of anti-Semitism. The new form of anti-Semitism seeks to do that to the Jewish collective. So if the old anti-Semitism and you can understand if you think about the yellow star of David, right? What was the yellow star of David that the Nazis made the Jews wear? The idea was the person you see wearing that star, you shun them. You don't engage with them. You don't shop at their stores. You don't use them as your doctors or your lawyers. They are beyond the pale. They're to be excluded from society. But what's happening today is that there's an effort to do that, not just to individual Jews, but to our Jewish collective. What's our Jewish collective? What represents the Jewish people? Our Jewish homeland, the Jewish nation state of Israel. And lo and behold, that is the one and only country that there are people in this world who claim has no right to exist, right? There are efforts now to say that that country is illegitimate since its creation. It's an illegitimate endeavor. So as I say, as Erwin Cutler explains, the if traditional anti-Semitism sought to deny the individual Jew his place in society, the new anti-Semitism seeks to deny the one and only Jewish state its place in the society of nations. And if you recognize that today's greatest evil is this idea of racism, apartheid, settler colonialism, then what do you see? You see that there are entities that claim that the one and only Jewish state is the worst offender of this generation's greatest evils. That there is no place worse, they claim, than the Jewish state when it comes to issues of racism, apartheid, settler colonialism. And yet Israel is the one place there in the Middle East where all genders, ethnicities, races, they all are equal under the law. And you have now an extraordinary government, right, that represents a remarkable breadth of diversity in terms of the current government, not to mention all the other, obviously, opportunities that have been provided in terms of uh, positions in government and academia and elsewhere that show that it is anything but an apartheid state. But today's anti-Semitism is blaming Israel for these, not places like Iran or China or Russia but Israel is considered the worst offender. That's today's contemporary anti-Semitism, and yet most people today still don't recognize that as anti-Semitism. So that's our first problem, is that people aren't even seeing this as anti-Semitism. Another problem is that this anti-Semitism, particularly the anti-Zionism, is often masked, and people claim that this is really just legitimate criticism of Israel. So what you often have taking place on campus is anti-Semitic harassment and discrimination, but the university administrators don't realize that that's what's taking place. Instead, they think that what they're witnessing is a political debate. They think that what they're, what's happening is on the one hand, you have a pro-Israeli community. On the other hand, you have a pro-Palestinian community and they are debating. They're expressing their viewpoints. And this is a dialogue. And sometimes when people have this kind of debate, there may be things that may be said that one side or the other may find offensive, but 
in the United States, for example, all this is speech that's protected speech. Even hate speech is protected speech. So from the university's perspective, they think not only do I have no obligation to get involved or get in the middle, I'm, they think they're prohibited from doing anything because their feeling is, well, we can't shut down anybody's speech. Everybody has a right to this speech. But overwhelmingly, that's not what's happening any, on campus, right? If you have a community that's saying, there are no two sides to this story, right? When you try and raise the fact that Hamas launched 4,000 rockets into Israel last May, and you're told, oh no, you can't raise that. Because if you raise that, you're automatically a racist, right? That's not somebody who wants to dialogue or have a discussion about these issues. And over and over again now, we see on these campuses, we see students, right? Any student who expresses support for the existence of the Jewish homeland, who believe that Israel has a right to exist as the Jewish homeland, that Jews have a right to exercise the right to self-determination in their ancestral homeland, anybody who, who believes that, it doesn't matter what their uh, political opinions are. It doesn't matter, they could be opposed to settlements, they could be opposed to the former Prime Minister Netanyahu, the conversation doesn't get there. As long as they say they support Israel, the existence of Israel as a Jewish state, they are marginalized, they're excluded, they're shunned. We have seen students who have been pushed out of their positions in student government, in clubs, clubs that they created, as a matter of fact, then people have turned on them and cut them off. Why? because it has become clear that they're Zionists. And as soon as one accepts that label, that they are a Zionist, that they, that they believe and take pride in, their, in the Jews' uh, shared ancestry and ethnicity, they take pride in their belonging to the Jewish people, they're treated as pariahs. Another problem, is right that people don't understand what Zionism is. People have a very skewed, mistaken idea of what Zionism is. Uh, many people now, because of the maligning of that term that we've seen, actually think that Zionism is synonymous with all of these evils. But even people who think they know what Zionism is, very often mistakenly think that Zionism is a political ideology that was established by Theodor Herzl in the late 1800s. Even that's not really fully correct because what most people don't understand or appreciate is that Judaism is not just a religion. That Jews not only share a common faith, but they share this sense of Jewish peoplehood. And their sense of Jewish peoplehood means that they feel connected not only to the Jewish people contemporaneously, but they feel connected to Jewish history. The history of the Jewish people becomes my history, right? We're about to celebrate Passover in a couple of weeks. That story, that history is all of our history as the Jewish people. And when we say at the end of that Seder, L'shana Habab Yerushalayim, next year in Jerusalem, that is a prayer that Jews have been saying for centuries. Right? It's not only that Jews pray facing Jerusalem. It's not only that we say on, on Passover, at the end of Yom Kippur, L'shana Bab Yerushalayim. But the truth is that over half of the 613 commandments in the Pentateuch actually relate to the land of Israel and can only be fulfilled in the land of Israel. That's how interconnected our history, our people, our culture, these weren't just commandments that relates to religious practice. These are commandments that range from everything from agriculture to how to conduct our lives as a nation in this, in this land. That's how deeply connected the Jewish people are to this land. And so if Jews take pride in our shared ancestry and ethnicity, if we celebrate the fact that Israel exists, that's, an expression of, our, of the Zionist part of our Jewish identity. And for many Jews, that expression, that feeling of connection to the land of Israel is as integral to their Jewish identity as observing Shabbat 
is keeping the Sabbath or observing a kosher diet. And I know people say to me, how, how can you say it's integral to Jewish identity when there are Jews who say Zionism is not a part of my Jewish identity? That's true. Not all Jews are Zionists. By the same token, though, not all Jews are Sabbath observers. And yet, if you ask any Jewish Sabbath observer, and that includes a very wide spectrum, right? Anybody who incorporates any kind of Shabbat observance into their life, whatever that may be, if you ask them why they do that, they'll tell you, oh, that's an expression of what it means to be Jewish. That's why I do it. By the same token, if you ask Jews who feel this connection to the land of Israel, why they feel that way, they'll tell you that's an expression of my Jewish identity. And so just like you do not have to, you don't yourself have to be a Jewish Sabbath observer to recognize that harassing or discriminating against a Sabbath observer on the basis of their Sabbath observance is unlawful harassment and discrimination. Right? You don't yourself have to be a Sabbath observer to acknowledge that, that you can't discriminate against a Sabbath observer for being a Sabbath observer. By the same token, you don't have to yourself be a Zionist to recognize that discriminating against or harassing or marginalizing or shunning or excluding an individual who expresses the Zionist part of their identity is also unlawful harassment and discrimination. So we need people to understand and recognize this Zionism that's integral to Jewish identity. Now, one of the um, stories that I like to tell that really I think demonstrates and brings that home is a story about the Ethiopian Jews who were airlifted in the 1980s and brought in, to Israel and rescued. Um, many people don't realize that that community, the Ethiopian Jewish community at that point, had no idea that the Jewish temple in Jerusalem had been destroyed. They lived in these villages so removed from modernity that they actually believed that they were going to be able to come in the 1980s to Jerusalem and go visit the Jewish temple. And they were devastated when they got to Israel and realized that it had been destroyed. And so sometimes around Tish B'Av, which is the day on the Jewish calendar that commemorates the destruction of the temp Jewish temple, Sometimes you'll see articles that are written by members of this Ethiopian community because they talk about how they actually experienced in their own lifetime the destruction of the Jewish temple. Because when they got to Israel and they realized it was destroyed, it was traumatic. So there was an article a few years ago written by one of these Ethiopian Jews who was a young woman. She was a child. Um, her name was Michala Vera Samuel. And she was a child at the time of the rescue. And she talks about in her article, she says, I'm just gonna quote, how strong was our belief in the sanctity of Jerusalem in our homes in Ethiopia. The most powerful educational concept that resonated with, within children and adults alike in Ethiopia, passed down from generation to generation, was awareness of the need to safeguard the purity of our hearts and deeds in order that we would one day be worthy of entering Jerusalem, heaven on earth. The ideal of Jerusalem was the force that provided us with the stamina to persevere during the arduous trek through the desert. They had to walk hundreds of miles, I have to tell you, through the desert. It was the dream that kept us going. We wanted to reach it, achieve it. We buried our beloved family members, left possessions behind willingly, and lost them to vicious thieves. We struggled to keep going despite the terrible conditions and the hunger, only because of our goal to reach Jerusalem of gold and after so many generations stand at the gates of the Holy Temple. Now think about that for a minute. Here she's talking about how this yearning to reach Jerusalem was what gave them to the strength to endure these awful hardships. You can think now today about the refugees from Ukraine who have had to walk also hours, days to try and reach safety. What gives them the strength to do that? In this case here for the Ethiopians, it was this powerful yearning to reach Jerusalem that had been passed on from parent to child, from generation to generation. Now, if this community didn't know that the Jewish temple had been destroyed, they certainly had not heard of Theodor Herzl 
and political Zionism. What they are describing, what she's describing is the Zionism that is integral to Jewish identity. That's what it is to be Jewish. It's to feel this connection to that land, to feel that that is our homeland, that that's where we belong, that that's the roots of our people, our heritage, our history, our culture, and to take pride in that, right? To take pride in all that the Jewish people over the centuries that we've survived, that we're back and that we've created a country that does so much, right? If you think about all the contributions that Jews and Jews even from Israel right, have made to the world over the centuries in all these areas from you know, uh, high tech, medicine, um, math and science, every, every culture, all the different areas that Israel has contributed to the world and continues to contribute, right? We take pride in that and you can take pride in that and that doesn't preclude also supporting human rights for everyone, Palestinians and everyone else, right? And so people have to understand that when Jews express this part of their Jewish identity, they can't be excluded on that basis. They can't be shunned on that basis. And what, what folks also don't understand is that Jews have historically been pressured to shed that part of our Jewish identity. If you go back and look at the very first time that Jews were offered equal rights, when they were offered emancipation, you go back to 1789 in France, when they were debating, the French National Assembly was debating the French Declaration of Rights of Man. And they were wondering, should this apply to Jews? They wondered also whether it should apply to women, but they didn't even have a debate about that. That was easy. They weren't going to apply it to women. But the question was, should it apply to Jews? And that there was a debate about. And the Count Clermont Tenier, there's a famous quote from those debates where he said, it's in terms of the Jews, every one of them he says, the Jews, this is the quote, the Jews should be denied everything as a nation, but granted everything as individuals. In other words, deny them everything as a people. But if they want to become French citizens as individuals, that's fine. He says, every one of them must individually become a citizen. And if they do not want this, they must inform us and we shall then be compelled to expel them. So what was the choice? The choice that was given to the Jews in France is either you say, I am a Frenchman. I pledge my allegiance only to France. I will no longer say I'm connected to some Jews in England or Germany or Spain or anywhere else. I'm only connected to France because France said, we'll only give you equal rights. And this is the first time Jews were offered equal rights. We will only give you those full equal rights if you get rid of this part of your Jewish identity that is this Jewish peoplehood and connection to or prayers for, right, a future land of Israel. And what did the Jews do? They said, France is our Zion. And this ended up being repeated again just a few years later in, uh, before the Dutch parliament, where they also turned around and said, we will only accept the Jews if they take an oath of allegiance only to our country, no other. As individuals, okay, but as a people, no. So historically, this is a pressure that Jews have for centuries felt. Society seems to feel uncomfortable with this idea of Jews as more than just a religion. If you wanna practice just your own private religion, okay but don't express this peoplehood, this connection to Jews, both contemporaneously or historically. But that's who we are. That's what, one of the things that makes our people unique. So just to talk a little bit about what we've done in the United States. In the United States, one of the laws that we have used is Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 
Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 says that any entity that receives federal government funds may not discriminate on the basis of race, color, or national ethnic origin. Right? What's interesting is that Title VI does not mention religion as a protected class. Now, Title VI, I should say first, applies to pretty much almost every institution of higher education in the United States. There are very, very few, just a small number of primarily parochial schools that are purely privately funded. Otherwise, both public and private institutions receive funds from the federal government. So they're all obligated um, to uh, satisfy these Title VI requirements. And what that means is they have to make sure that all of their students are provided with an equal educational opportunity all the students, no matter right, what their uh, background, their race, their nationality, their ethnicity, they all have to have equal access to all of the educational opportunities that the university provides. If not, if it turns out that there are students who are experiencing discrimination and who are not being given that equal access, then the universities are at risk of losing those federal funds because they can only get it if they've made sure that all the students are given that equal access. There are ways to raise complaints about universities. Either an individual a student could go to court and file a formal lawsuit or a complaint, or what most prefer to do is go the administrative route and file a complaint against the university with the Department of Education. The Department of Education has an office for civil rights which is the office in the Department of Education that reviews these complaints. And this is an avenue that the Brandeis Center has utilized to try and motivate universities to take the steps necessary to address anti-Semitic harassment and discrimination on university campuses. And what we've done is made it clear to these universities, and oftentimes, and I will say, we will try first with the universities, right? To raise the issue with them, to demonstrate for them that what is actually happening on their campus is harassment and discrimination of Jewish students, either on the basis of the traditional anti-Semitic tropes, like the allegations of Jews as being all powerful and controlling, um, or with increasing frequency now on campus, these are allegations uh, they are basically being precluded from fully experiencing the campus opportunities because they're being pushed out because they've expressed the Zionist part of their Jewish identity. And we have had uh, some success. So for example, we filed a complaint against the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and uh, one of the first things that we did, one of the first things that we did with the university when the Department of Education opened up its investigation, which is ongoing, is we negotiated a joint statement with the university. And I'm just gonna read to you a piece of that joint statement on anti-Semitism. The joint statement says, for many Jewish students, Zionism is an integral part of their identity and their ethnic and ancestral heritage. These students have the right to openly express identification with Israel. The university will safeguard the abilities of these students as well as all students to participate in university sponsored activities free from discrimination and harassment. We deplore anti-Semitic incidents on campus, including those that demonize or delegitimize Jewish and pro-Israel students or compare them to Nazis. This subjects them to double standards that are not applied to others. All Jewish students, including those who identify with Israel or Jewish campus organizations should be able to participate in campus activities aimed at fighting racism and achieving social justice. And it goes on. But the main point, and one of the things that I think is, is very important and significant about this, and we'd love to see other universities do the same, is that the universities have recognized and need to recognize that for many of the students on their campus, Zionism is integral to their identity as Jews. 
and that it is unlawful to marginalize, ostracize, or exclude them on that basis. And that the university, when that starts to happen, must step in to make sure that the university remains a safe, welcoming, inclusive space for all of these students. We see now with the rise in these diversity, equity, and inclusion programs, these DEI programs, that unfortunately, many of these programs don't recognize and don't include Jewish identity or Jews as a group that also needs the protection from harassment and discrimination. It's disturbing, ironic, and troubling that these DEI programs, which are intended to try and educate and sensitize the university communities to discrimination and bias in order to try and reduce the discrimination and bias that takes place on campus, that those programs are actually, oftentimes inadvertently, but actually fostering anti-Semitic and notions and hostile feelings towards Jews. The way this happens, and the way we've seen it happen, is that the programs will, we have a case, for example, against Stanford University, where there were um, clinicians, part of the uh, employees at, CAT, at uh, Stanford who would provide mental health support to students at Stanford who needed it. And I guess it's now about a year and a half, two years ago, they instituted a DEI program where they wanted to try and educate these therapists so that they could provide better support for the students because they would understand bias and harassment. And so they started to talk and to have regular programs. The first thing that they did is they divided the therapists into a white affinity group and then in a group for the others. But they put all the Jewish employees into the white affinity group, which for some of the Jewish employees, particularly those who had family who had been um, killed in the Holocaust and targeted in the Holocaust, for them to be put in a group where they were told that they, like white supremacists, had to um, uh, investigate and, and, and work on right, their, their racist attitudes, that was um, that, that didn't feel like the right fit. It was very, it was triggering and it wasn't, there was no place, right? And what happened then is that the university actually experienced anti-Semitism on campus. So this was early in COVID and there was a Zoom bombing of a university-wide program. And the Zoom bombing included both swastikas um, and anti-Black racist images and the use of the N-word. And when they had the program to discuss this with the therapists, they decided they were only going to address the anti-Black racist imagery from the Zoom bombing. And when the Jewish members, the Jewish therapists said, well, what about the swastikas and the anti-Semitism? They said, oh no, right? the Jews, basically the Jews are powerful. The Jews, you know, we can't decenter the conversation. But this, it shouldn't be a zero sum game. You should be able to address all the harassment and discrimination that's taking place. And then again, later on, when there were other swastikas at another time on campus, they refused to address it. And each time the Jewish therapist would try to bring this up, they were told that this was an example of them being racist, privileged, powerful, controlling. So the only way in this program and that we see in many of these DEI programs that Jews are even discussed or portrayed is as white oppressors, colonialists, categories that are essentially synonymous with the anti-Semitic stereotypes of a Jew. I had a discussion with a professor at one university where there are no Jewish students and this professor is actually retired. And he told me a story about how years ago before he retired, he taught a class in anti-Semitism and how he had decided because there were no Jewish students on this campus, he would actually teach about Judaism as part of this class of Jewish uh, on anti-Semitism because how could you understand anti-Semitism if you don't know anything about what Judaism is and what Jewish, the Jewish people are. 
And, uh, and he told me that after he retired, somebody else took over teaching that class. And now that professor was retiring. And so next year, the class won't be offered anymore. But what he was really troubled about is that a new president started at this university. And the first thing that this president did is institute a requirement that all students must take a diversity, equity, and inclusion class in order to graduate. And this professor said to me, I know the faculty member who's going to be teaching this DEI class. And I know how the Jews are going to be portrayed. They're going to be portrayed, the only way they'll be included in this is as white oppressor colonialists. And he said, there are no Jews on this campus. These students are not going to meet a Jew while they're on campus. He said, and now you're requiring every single one of the students on this campus to take this class. And you'll be surprised when they all graduate why they have these negative feelings towards Jews. That's very frightening. That's what we have to educate the world to understand is intolerable. We have to make the world and society recognize that Jews are also a people and that discriminating against or marginalizing or harassing Jews who express and take pride in our sense of Jewish peoplehood and our connection to the land of Israel, that that is a form of national ethnic origin discrimination and cannot be tolerated. And just the last thing I will say, and we'll go to questions, is that I think one of the most important things that everybody can do to try and address and combat this is to embrace your Jewish identity with pride. In order for students or anybody to be able to have the wherewithal to push back, our Jewish identity has to be more than just a Jew who combats anti-Semitism. There has to be an identity that we feel we have that's worth fighting for. And so probably the most important thing that people could do is read, educate, learn about Jewish history, Jewish culture. You know, the late Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, who was the former chief rabbi of the UK, has beautiful, very accessible commentary in English on the Bible. I mean, he's written about all sorts of things, but you can easily online even find his weekly commentary on the portions that are read each week. And you will see, if you start to read just that, how all of these notions of social justice, these principles that we're fighting for, you know where they originate? In our history, in our culture, in the Bible, in our philosophy, that's where it starts. That's where it starts. And we should feel proud. We should embrace that identity with pride and with knowledge. Because the most important thing to remember is that the best answer to harassment and discrimination is self-confidence and pride. And that's what we need. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Lisa, I'm now going to ask Mariana to turn on her video and uh, unmute, and she has uh, questions to um, put to you. Hello, everyone. Um, okay, so jumping right into it. Uh, my name is Mariana. I'm a third year student at Ryerson. I will be asking a few questions. So the first question is, is there, is there an approach you have used in the US that you think could be replicated in Canada or in other countries? So yeah, that's a great question. And, I, and the answer is yes. Uh, while Canada doesn't have the Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, Canada does have laws that protect individuals from harassment and discrimination on the basis of their national ethnic origin. And I think that what's key, as I talked about, is for people to understand that what's happening is not a political disagreement. It's not that Jewish students or others are being shut down because they're expressing an opinion that supports Israel. What's happening is they are expressing a part of their identity as Jews. When we talked about the Ethiopian Jews, right? This is 
part and parcel of what it means to us to be Jewish. And we are being marginalized, harassed, and excluded on that basis. Lawyers, I would hope, in Canada or even elsewhere, because the idea of protecting against discrimination on the basis of national ethnic origin, that's an idea that's universal, right? It exists not only in the US, in Canada, in countries around the globe. We should be able to use that, those laws, and you and make it clear that they apply to Jews in this situation. Discriminating against Jews, it's not enough to say that we just discriminate you know, we protect against Jews who are being discriminated on the basis of their religious practice. Jews also have to be protected on the basis of their celebration of their shared ancestry and ethnicity. They have to be recognized as an ethno-religion and those legal protections can be brought to bear, I think also in Canada as well as elsewhere. So diving into the experience, so the student experience, what is the Brandeis Center's Jigsaw Fellowship? Could you talk about that a bit? Yeah, so the, our Jigsaw Fellowship, it's a long acronym. It technically stands for Justice Initiative Guiding Student Activists Worldwide. That's what our Jigsaw is. But it's a program that we run for law school students uh, where we train law school students who are interested in this uh, in the areas of law that they need to understand from the anti-discrimination laws to First Amendment laws, to the principles of academic freedom, to some of the international law issues relating to Israel. And we do that so that then the law school students are able to work with uh, the, primarily as undergraduates, although they also work with graduate students, who are experiencing the anti-Semitism and the Jew hatred on campus. And what we have found is that undergraduates, or any students really, sometimes feel very intimidated when it comes to talking to a lawyer. They mistakenly think that if they talk to a lawyer, suddenly it means they're gonna find themselves as the plaintiffs in some lawsuit, their name's gonna be in bright neon lights. That's not the case. Um, what, what the law students are able to do is they're able to help the students um, articulate what's happening to them when they talk to the universities in a way that the universities will understand. Right? When we say that universities think that what they're witnessing is a political debate, they need to understand the marginalization and exclusion. So you know, one example that I, I give is there's a, a student pre-COVID who had come to me at one point and showed me a photograph that had been taken on her campus. They traditionally, once a week, there would be the opportunity for all the extracurricular clubs on campus to put out tables and to share information about their clubs. This way students would know all the different opportunities on campus. And this student was tabling for the Zionist Organization of America, for ZOA. And a member of Students for Justice in Palestine took her picture, put it up on social media, and basically said, Zionism is the equivalent of white supremacy. Why is she even permitted you know, to be in this campus square? And they blurred her face, right? They blocked her. And she said, I want to tell the university, I'm afraid for my safety, right? People, people still know who I am. And I said, okay, that makes sense. I said, but make sure that you also point out to the administrators the second part of this, because what are they saying to you? They're saying that because you're a Zionist, you're not welcome in the public square on campus. Only you should be kicked out of that public square, right? That, that's the denying the equal opportunity to the Jewish student on the basis of her expression of her identity. Our Jigsaw Fellows, as well as the Brandeis Center, that's what we do. We help the students because when she then goes to the university and points that out, oh, that will resonate with them because then they realize, ooh, that's something that we have to make sure doesn't happen. They know that. They're, they're trained and sensitized to protect students from harassment and discrimination. So it has to resonate to them as harassment and discrimination. And that's what we teach our Jigsaw Fellows to help the undergraduates to do and why it's so important, and I will say, for students to reach out for this kind of guidance. And I should let the people who are watching know, if people do experience anti-Semitism on campus and they want to reach the Brandeis Center, one of the easiest ways is just send an email to info at brandeiscenter.com. And we will be able to either put you in touch with one of our staff or our Jigsaw Fellows and try and help assist you um, on campus. So that leads into the next question, which addresses the campus. 
what role does a university governing council have in setting policies and should that body be pressured into um, adopting IHRA? So is that, and this is gonna be a little bit of a language issue between Canada and the U. Are we talking about the student government here? Or are we talking about the university administrators here? What, what's the question? I'll interject. Uh, okay. that governing councils here are like the boards of governors. They're the, the, the board over the, the uh, entire university. They're volunteers, usually appointed by, some are appointed by government and others uh, by the community at the university itself. So are these like trustees? They or? are trustees and the boards are chaired by the president of the university. As I looked into it, and there are student representatives. Um, so um, it's in some case maybe operating almost like a rubber stamp body. But from what I can understand, when you read their governance rules, they are the ultimate trustees of the university. So I do think that it's important to try and educate these trustees and the boards of trustees, or it could be with some of our um, public institutions, we have boards of regents, they don't have students on them in the United States. Uh, but absolutely, you know, the IRA definition. So in the United States, uh, IRA, whether the universities formally adopt them or not, they are, their conduct is going to be governed with the IRA definition applying. Because what happened in the United States is, in terms of the history of Title VI, uh, Title VI was recognized and understood that even though it doesn't mention religion, when members of faith-based groups are being targeted on the basis of their shared ancestry and ethnicity, in other words, on the basis it could be of their uh, national or ethnic origin or their race, right? they don't lose that protection just because they also share a common faith. That was became established and understood uh, through guidance letters. What the what happened in 2019 is that there was an executive order in the United States that linked that understanding of Title VI with the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism. This was President Trump's executive order on combating anti-Semitism, where he said, okay, we're going to kind of kick up a notch this understanding of the Title VI guidance and make it clear that members of faith-based groups, including Jews, are protected by Title VI. But he also linked it. He said, when you end up investigating an allegation of anti-Semitism, you look to the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism to understand what anti-Semitism is. So all of these universities are governed in a way by IRA. So they should, and this is one of the things we say, they should formally adopt it as part of their own internal anti-discrimination policies. But whether they formally do or not, if they're challenged, it, it will be applied in the United States. In Canada too, Canada's adopted the IRA definition. So there, there should be a way to say to these governing boards, look, Canada has adopted IRA. We're telling you that there is harassment and discrimination taking place on the campus against Jewish students on the basis of the ancestral ethnic, their ancestral ethnic origin. That's a violation of Canada's charter, right? If they're, 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 and therefore, you combine the two, the IRA and this, this is how this is understood. And you, I, there, I leave it to Canadian lawyers, right? To figure out how you link those two. But I absolutely do think that there's a way to try and explain to them that the IRA definition um, governs and should be applied. And it makes sense therefore for them to, um, to formally acknowledge that. Perfect. Um, the, okay, so drawing from that, can your organization or, or other NGOs focused on civil rights for Jews act independently if Jewish students are afraid to be named in a complaint? And if not, what do we do to encourage students to come forward? Sure. So uh, the answer, at least in the United States, is these complaints, when I talked about administrative complaints with the office that are filed with the Office for Civil Rights, the students can remain anonymous. Uh, when complaints are filed, they're not the complaint is not made public by the Office for Civil Rights. Sometimes the person who files it wants to make it public because part of the pressure they want to put on the university is to make it, uh, is to make it public. But, uh, but otherwise, it is not a public document. And the, the other important piece is that 
it can be filed. The complaints can be filed by anybody. They do not have to be filed by the person who actually experienced the anti-Semitic harassment and discrimination. So the Brandeis Center, for example, can file the complaints as the Brandeis Center, and we can describe what happened to the students. The students can either be anonymous witnesses, right? Once the Office for Civil Rights decides they want to investigate, then they may ask to speak to the student, but they also are willing to often, you know, keep, maintain that, an, that anonymity. They're not looking to publicize it. So the short answer is, yes, students can work with the Brandeis Center in the United States. They can file complaints and they can remain anonymous. So moving into the students and what they can and can't do, have you found that that uh, coordination between Hillel, Hasbara Fellowship, Stand With Us, Students Supporting Israel, and other student bodies make for a better outcome for Jewish students, and how so? I The coordination now is, in comparison, for instance, to what it was a decade ago, is remarkable. Um, there is much greater coordination now among the different organizations. Coordination can always be improved, I think, um, but the coordination at this point is, is, is good, it's strong, and uh, I'm very glad to see it. And I will say that as the Brandeis Center, it's been very gratifying as all these different organizations that you mentioned have recognized uh, the additional benefit that the law can provide, right? The law is an extremely powerful motivator. While organizations that are not legal advocacy organizations can try to explain to university administrators what we're talking about, how you should understand anti-Semitism, you should understand the history, you should understand how anti-Semitism manifests and what we see now contem you know, contemporaneously. Universities can say, oh, that's very nice and, and just listen and feel educated, but they may not do anything. What actually motivates them to do something is, they, is the legal liability, right? They want to stay on the right side of the law. And so the law is an extremely powerful motivator. And what all of these organizations have come to recognize is that that's the case. And so oftentimes what they will do is they'll reach out to the Brandeis Center for that support, for that additional legal analysis and understanding so that they, they can incorporate that or we can help them with that. Um, educate the university on why this is not just something nice for them to learn, but why they actually have to start to take some concrete action to address it. So students who are part of an organization, you said there is a there's coordination between and it has improved. And then you also talked about how students who are independent don't have to file under their name. That kind of moves into what can be done in a classroom where a faculty member spouts lies about Israel and how can a student protect themselves if they challenge the professor? So if they're actively independent wanting to pursue that in the moment? That is probably the um, most challenging, most disturbing again, and most challenging situation that we have. Because in the classroom is where the faculty member has uh, their, their rights, like their academic freedom rights are strongest. Um, that said, a faculty member um, is entitled to teach their subject matter, the subject matter of their class. Uh, they are given wide latitude on how to teach that, but it has to be within their subject area. So you, you can't have a math professor who suddenly goes off on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, right? That's not appropriate in that class. Um, professors should, not be um, either teaching propaganda or uh, espousing violence or um, making what is their own individual personal political opinion appear to be the opinion of the university, right? Or using their university title or their university in that, in that way. Um, so, and I have to say, absolutely, students in the classroom may not be treated differently or penalized or shut down in any way because their opinion differs from that of the professor, 
So if there is a student who feels that they're not being graded fairly or they don't have the opportunity to uh, express a counter position because that wouldn't be tolerated or accepted in the class or the professor's not calling on them because the professor doesn't wanna hear the contrary opinion, um, you know, or they've somehow been uh, demeaned or uh, marginalized or shamed somehow in that classroom. Like all of those go beyond and are potentially actionable, but it really depends on each situation. And again, if, if students are experiencing that, I encourage them to reach out for, for guidance on how we might be able to help them. Mm -hmm. So a recent report from the American organization Amcha Initiative found that the presence of boycott-oriented faculty increased the likelihood of anti-Semitism on campus, of malice towards students who express support for Israel, and even endangered Jewish students. Can this report in itself be used to challenge a university to prohibit BDS activities and student bodies to halt clearly anti-Israel programming like the anti-Israel apartheid week? So one of the things that I think is clear um, from that and, and the way perhaps to get universities to address this is to explain to the universities, it is intolerable if you are permitting on your university campus, faculty or TAs, right? We've seen this from TAs too. If you're permitting them to try and rile up one part of your university community to turn against another part of your university community, right? Your goal as the university administration is to make sure that your campus is a safe and welcoming space for all the students. You can't tolerate your faculty members riling up one community to turn on the other. That's unacceptable. So to the extent that what's happening is your faculty is doing that either by the way they're you know, lecturing, presenting the material they're providing, you know, what we're seeing is when they do that, it emboldens the students to go out there and to engage in this very discriminatory fashion with the Jewish students, right? They turn around and they come out of these classes where they've been taught that you know, Israel has no right to exist and anybody who supports it is, is, a, is a colonialist, is an oppressor, is a lover of apartheid, is racist. And so then the students come out of that class and then they say to somebody, well, what are you? You're a Zionist? Well, then you're a racist. I just, I just heard it from my professor. Of course you're a, you're a racist, right? Well, then that, that starts to create this, this division on campus. The administration needs to understand, right? That what's happening, you know, when we think about these these programs on campus, there's a, um, uh, they need to understand how BDS referendums or the uh, deadly exchange campaigns, for example, are being used as litmus tests. I'll just give you another example. At uh, Tufts University, the uh, last year, there was a deadly exchange campaign. Deadly exchange talks about how uh, it seeks to blame the police brutality in the United States on Jews and Israel, because they say, where did the police in America learn how to treat uh, minorities this way and to be violent and discriminatory, they went on a trip to Israel, right? So as part of the uh, booklet, right, they put out, a, Students for Justice in Palestine put out this booklet for their deadly exchange campaign. So this is supposed to be talking about improving safety and security for students in Tufts. And inside this brochure is this map. Now this map, it's a pretty remarkable map because if you notice, you can see it, all of Israel is marked as occupied territories, not the West Bank. All of Israel is marked as occupied territories and the whole thing is called Palestine. This map is not a map put out by people who are looking for two states for two people. This is not a map that's put out by people who are looking to dialogue or for compromise, right? This is a map that's put out by people that wanna wipe Israel off the face of the earth and that believe that Israel as a Jewish homeland has no right to exist. And yet it's put here in this booklet, why? Because this is the litmus test. If you want to fight for racial and social justice, you have to accept that map. If you can't accept that map, you're obviously a racist. But even a Jew who might stand for two states, might think that's the solution or who is opposed right to settle, they can't accept that map. So what is that doing? 
That's what the university administrators need to understand. They need to understand how the faculty, the BDS referendums, these maps are just doing, the only thing they're doing is seeking to divide the community and pit one side against the Jews who as an expression of their Jewish identity believe that Israel has a right to exist as a Jewish homeland. I'm going to interject now because I see the time, but I know people are still interested and I'm going to um, take the moderator's prerogative if you don't mind, Mariana, because I see several questions that really overlap that people have been trying to get to you and, and maybe you could answer it. And it's probably because it's also most upsetting to me. Um, one of the uh, problems in making the stance about Jewish ethnicity is the pervasive and growing presence of anti-Zionist Jewish groups. And most recently it came to the attention of several of us that Independent Jewish Voices has formed a chapter at the University of Toronto and they claim to be the anti-Zionist Jewish group. And they work along with uh, what we would, what are perceived to be pro-Palestinian groups that really do nothing more than run anti-Israel campaigns and, and programs. And not only do they do the Israel Apartheid Week, but they run ongoing um, pressure events virtual and in person. So the questions I'm seeing relate to what do you do when it's the Jews that are against us? And what about the, the, the claim that representing Jewish interests is silencing Palestinian voices? And, um, and therefore you're into almost, you know, a classic religio, religious and race war right on the campus. So we'll start with the second nobody's silencing Palestinian voices. And in fact, it's the opposite. If, um, if anything you see, and I see it over and over again, that when Jews are being pushed out, what they turn around and they say is, we want a dialogue, we want to talk, right? Tell us your story. I'll tell you another example here. At NYU a few years ago, there was a BDS resolution that was signed by 53 student organizations. It was the entire progressive community on campus. But what that resolution didn't just call for boycotting Israeli products and Israeli you know, companies that do business with Israel. It called for boycotting all the pro-Israel groups on campus, meaning they would have nothing to do with them. They wouldn't co-sponsor events, wouldn't engage with them. So the university to its credit realized that maybe this is not a good thing. And NYU actually paid a professional facilitator to come in and to try and facilitate a dialogue with these students. And so they had representatives from the 53 student groups come to this meeting with this professional facilitator who started out by saying, we're going to have a dialogue. This is not a debate. A debate will be where you would try and convince people I'm right, you're wrong. That's not what this is. This is just, we're going around the room and respectfully sharing our feelings, our thoughts, so that people can hear different perspectives. That's what this is. And what was supposed to be a one and a half hour dialogue turned into a two and a half hour discussion about whether the anti-Zionists would even deign to dialogue with the Zionists. They said, we showed up at this meeting because we don't wanna risk losing our student government funding. So we're here, but you can't make us talk. And there was one Palestinian student in that room. And he said, I don't understand it. The Jewish students who are here seem to wanna to hear my story, but my allies won't let me tell it. And he said, that's right. And at the end, after two and a half hours, the facilitator gave up so I can't do anything, went home and the university announced we're not going to divest from Israel. That's very nice, but it doesn't do anything to address the interpersonal problems that are happening on your campus. And that's the truth. The truth is nobody's shutting down Palestinian voices. The Palestinians don't want to dialogue. The Palestinians are the ones, I mean, some, right? There are some, and you can dialogue with those, but the ones who are claiming that we're shutting down the Palestinian voices are the ones who are saying there's no two sides to the story. They're the ones who are saying, I'm not even going to talk to you. That's not a request for a dialogue and nobody's shutting down their voices. That's number one. The other question you asked about the Jewish students, it's, it's hard, it's painful. And the one thing that I, that I suggest right, is that the answer is you're not and you cannot try to make a non-Zionist a Zionist. That's not and should never be your goal, okay? Um, all you want to do is say, look, I, when I express Zionism, that for me is a part of my identity as a Jew. It may not be 
a part of your identity as a Jew. But I need you to accept and recognize that trying to push me out, trying to exclude me, treating me in a discriminatory fashion, because I do feel that that's a part of my Jewish identity, that's not right, right? I'm not trying to do that to you. I'm saying, okay, we disagree, but I haven't turned around. You don't have the pro-Israel community that's turned around and sought to exclude or discriminate or you know, gotten up and said with the same way, right? If you accept this map, you're a racist to the Jew, you know? The, w w so that's, that's what we have to agree upon, right? You may have your idea of what Jewish identity is. I have my feeling what Jewish identity is. Don't try and marginalize or exclude me or create a litmus test for me to engage in the progressive community, right? That's the problem. The problem is we have students who care so deeply about all these issues, women's rights, LGBTQ rights, immigration rights, climate change, voting rights, whatever the issues are, and they're being told the only way they can engage in those is if they shed the Zionist part of their Jewish identity. And the anti-Zionists have to know, you can't keep me out of these movements just because I'm a Zionist. That's wrong. That's wrong. Thank you, Elisa. You've given us a lot to think about and your passion is infectious, thankfully. I see a lot of comments saying she's brilliant, she's wonderful, thank you, thank you. So let me express thank you. And thank you, Mariana, for taking a lead on questions. I appreciate everybody participating today. A recording will be available within the next, I don't know, 48 hours and we'll send it to everyone. Thank you for participating, stay well. Bye for now. Thank you.